Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. Western press reports are saying Russian troops are amassing on the Ukraine border. Russia says these are normal troop movements. There's a war of words between Congress and the Kremlin. But it seems fairly clear now, as the dust more or less settles, the uh, Russian annexation of Crimea will have to be de facto recognized by Ukraine and the West. And the strategy now of President Obama and Europe is to quickly try to integrate Ukraine into the EU orbit and the American orbit. $18 billion IMF loan is being promised to the Ukraine and more. Now joining us to unpack all of this is Derek Monroe. He's an independent journalist based in Illinois. He covered the Ukraine for Foreign Policy and Focus, a Washington-based publication for the Institute for Policy Studies. He's also recently has an article on Truth Out about the Ukraine. Thanks for joining us, Derek. It's good to be here. So let, let's go back. You were in the Ukraine three weeks ago. Uh, give us a picture of what you observe, what you know in terms of the lead up to the uh, change in government. Some people are calling it a coup. Well, well, actually, the red coup's cause of the problem itself stems from 2004 West West supported Orange Revolution, where uh, the uh, oligarch Timoshenko, uh, who actually happens to be returning to power right now, just she announced to be running for the president yesterday, has actually won the election over Yanukovych with uh, Yush, uh, with Mr. Yushchenko, and uh, when they took the power with the wild support of the uh, of the Western uh, powers. Uh, they made a lot of promises to the voters of streamlining, bringing economic prosperity to the nation, what have you. And uh, the major point of frustration that actually brought people to the Maidan basically is a failure of, of the past 10 years to really bring any change or any improvement in standard of living for the Ma Maidan, Maidan being the place where the protests broke out recently. That's right, the Independence Square. And uh, ultimately, um, what really started the movement itself was actually a... Uh, very peaceful pro uh, demonstration took place on the 23rd of November, which a week later was uh, basically attacked by Berkut, which was a uh, riot police of, of the Yanukovych government. And uh, that galvanized the images of the very pretty ferocious beatings of the students actually went pretty much um, viral all over the country. And that galvanized a lot of people from different political spectrum to actually go in and uh, in sol solidarity to, to share the, uh, the, uh, anger over the beating of the students themselves. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, on the, around 30th of November, uh, a variety of different groups came out of the woodwork, which themselves were extension of the political setup of the Kogna Rada, which is a parliament itself, where uh, the, the groups came out very well organized, very well armed and funded with, from a variety of different political spectrums on the right. As it happens, uh, to truly understand the political situation in Ukraine, one has to understand the situation within the Rakovna Rada, which is a parliament of Ukraine. As it happens, the uh, ma majority of, of the opposition parties uh, on the right, and actually, and including the Party of Regions, which was that time ruling party of Ukraine, are funded and run by uh, political oligarchs. And uh, this basically comes from a geopolitical and economic setup within the new Ukraine, where basically creates a system, almost a se semi-feudal system, where five uh, major oligarch families are running the whole economy. It's gotten to a point where uh, the people are simply are shut out from any kind of political making, uh, poli policy making and process. And this also galvanized ge population in general to simply go on the street and uh, base their frustration with possibility of, of not being associated with the Euro with European Union, to which they were looking for basically much better standard of living, much better prospect for their future. And so, as it happened, when the uh, I got to Maidan about second week of February, uh, during a sort of a lull in fighting, and uh, what really galvanized the situation to, to come to the explosion was the 18th of February uh, at Yanukovych administration's ultimatum to clear this, the government buildings within the square itself by 6 p.m. or face the repercussions and attack of the police and militia and uh, Berkut forces. And uh, as some groups have taken the advantage of the amnesty and vacated the buildings, uh, there, was, there have been a lot of internal fighting between the variety of different a nationalist, fascist, and you know, a neo, ne basically neo-Nazi groups, which basically took over one building versus the other, and that created sort of re some somewhat of an interesting razzmatazz of different political factions fighting over the territory and so on and so forth. However, the consensus was taken uh, within a within the right sector 
that, uh, that they're not going to vacate. They simply do not trust the government. So when the police attacked, it got to the point where there's been a sort of a very interesting and very medieval warfare, almost positional warfare with a variety of different weapons being used, most of the medieval style weapons. However, there are also guns brought to the, to the place itself, which in itself, uh, then there was a ceasefire. And then once again, uh, which was broken up by, by the rebels. And at, at the end, it got a situation where uh, there were the people on the right were able to get through the police barricades and basically took over the government government buildings uh, and threatening the life of the president Yanukovych at that time, uh, which basically fled when he basically fled because of the threats to him and his family. Mm-hmm. At that time, Velkov Narada basically had an extraordinary late to the night, uh, basically, uh, a conference where they decided to basically remove the Yanukovych from power, regardless of the of the Constitution, Article 111, which specifically states they have to get at least mi- minimal 338 votes in order to a resolution like that to pass, not to mention follow the impeachment process, which hasn't happened. And also what's really troubling is that um, there were Svoboda and probably the probably sector fighters present at the, at the time of the voting within the parliament itself, which basically are the lowest common denominator indicators of the, of the coup and military and paramilitary putsch. So it got in a situation where uh, the West has really got himself in a situation of supporting uh, government, which was basically a provisional temporary government, which was basically not necessarily elected, but selected. Right, now and, just just a couple of questions. The, sure. First of all, Yanukovych, uh, you know, one of the things that sparked all of this was that he did not want to move closer to the uh, agreement with the EU and NATO um, what, where were the Ukrainian oligarchs in all of this? Well, I think majority of the oligarchs are looking at it from a very, their own personal and economic interest. Yanukovych, the reason that Yanukovych would not go to the West, although there are certain indicators that he was willing to, is simply uh, the Ukrainian economy was simply on the verge of bankruptcy. And uh, Russia came up with the uh, very strong uh, persuasive amounts of money being given to bail out the economy, which means $15 billion plus the one third of the discount on the gas, which Ukraine is the major source of revenue for Ukraine itself, where it then is transported to the West. While the European Union made a lot of promises, they really didn't put any money on the table whatsoever. And it's gotten a situation where a lot of people, commentators in, in Ukraine actually stating that it was actually done on purpose to sort of a create much b- bigger anger within the population just to remove the Yanukovych in itself. And there are a lot of accusations right now flying in the Ukrainian media, specifically on both spectrums that the European Union didn't really bargain in a good faith. So as far as the economic concern, uh, interests of the oligarchs, oligarchs are concerned, uh, a lot of them simply kind of stood on the sideline, although they were supporting a variety of different uh, right-wing groups and fascist groups, what have you. But I think the idea was to simply maneuvered the situation for much bigger consolidation of their own power. And what happened the 21st night of the uh, of February was simply when we took the coup, coup, coup took place is that oligarchs basically duck, directed their own uh, supporters within Verkov Narada, even the ones of the ruling party, to vote against the Yanukovych because it got in a situation that Yanukovych became sort of a much bigger increasing liability to them than simply a stalwart. But, of but in, terms, in terms of their underlying interest, do the Ukrainian oligarchs uh, want to join with the European oligarchs and, instead of the Russian oligarchs? Originally not, but uh, as, as it happened, as the political pressure came to fore, plus you have to also understand that there was a agreement worked out between the European Union and the U.S. government, which was very heavily involved in the negotiation of Yanukovych's departure, to have the Yanukovych basically sit for another six months till the next election, and then it would have been a peaceful transition of power. And the right-wing sector, basically, and fascists and, neo- and neo-Nazis, they broke that. They broke that. They basically sent the team to the Yanukovych residence, threatening his life and his family. Therefore, basically, he fled. So, so, uh, so the, the agreement, which was worked out together with the European Union and with the U.S. involvement, was simply was broken. Was not even worth the paper it was written. Now, are the, the the groups you're describing as fascist and far right and such, are they connected with representing the interest of certain Ukrainian oligarchs? Yes, they are. And I actually got in a situation where, when I was a base at a press center, I really followed in in the piece that I have in Truthout 
follow the money. Where is the money coming to basically fund a variety of different activities at Euromaidan? And actually, uh, it's not a that's not a really uh, big news, uh, new news actually. The Bloomberg wrote that Pinchuk, which is one of the largest or oligarchs, together with uh, another oligarch, uh, Poroshenko, we actually right now is actually writing. This is going to be writing for the president. They did give quite a substantial amount of money to the to to a variety of with and so it was basically a, a sort of a, uh, a palace school in the way. You can you can actually say which extended itself to the streets with each individual faction supporting each individual group they you know that they, they, they receive money from. So when the Russians accuse uh, 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 characterize this as a coup, they're right. Um, yes, there. If you look at the at letter of the law, letter of the constitution, which I was I was able to read in original Ukrainian and also in translations, just to make sure that it's not missing. And look at the steps which need to be taken, must be taken, in order for any kind of removal of power to take place. They're correct. Okay. Now, the role of the Americans in all this. There was that famous leaked phone call uh, where the American ambassador is talking yeah. to the American Undersecretary of State for Europe, and uh, or Assistant Undersecretary, I guess it is. Uh, Victoria Nuland. Yeah. Yeah. And and they seem heavily involved in determining who's who's going to come to power out of all of this. Uh, how how big a footprint is the American footprint in all in this? I think it's quite big in the way that basically you have to kind of follow the money. Where's the money going through? And it starts not only necessarily with the, even goes going back earlier to December the thirteenth uh, conference. Uh, in Washington Press Club, where she actually announced that the U.S. invested over $5 billion into the quote-unquote positive democratic outcome in Ukraine, whatever that means. And also she was standing right next to the uh, huge uh, corporate logo of Chevron. And there is no, no coincidence whatsoever. Despite the political razzmatazz, corruption, and all the different evils which were which our American government actually gave us a justification to supporting the coup and also supporting the quote-unquote democratic movement, Chevron Corporation was a uh, year before went in and actually inked a very lucrative $10 billion agreement with the Yanukovych government to explode their shale gas, aka fracking. So this is basically a very much a not necessarily political setup, but also very much economic setup, which is beneficial for one, in this in this case, Chevron Corporation. So you really look at it. And, and one thing you also, it's worth mentioning is simply, uh, Victoria Luland didn't really show up so, simply out of nowhere. She's married to Robert Kagan, which is a, basically a father father of the uh, new project for the new American century. So, despite of the political change and which took place in 2008, when President Obama was uh, ele- elected, it seems very much that the same political powers that be during the Iraq wars in Afghanistan are currently playing the same ro- chief role in formulating American foreign policy in Ukraine or other places for that for that matter. It seems that in this case, to be a sort of a family affair. And for those who don't know, Project for New American Century was a document written by American neoconservatives, I guess it was essentially during the, near the end of the Clinton period, where they recommended, let's recognize we are the world's single superpower <laughs> and we should project our power everywhere and shape the world as, as we please. It's, we're no longer in a world where we have to deal with another superpower. But maybe they're finding out that isn't quite so true here. I mean, they're not pushing Russia around quite as much as perhaps they thought they might be able to. Yes, and I think, first of all, I think what's really missing from the U.S. media coverage is simply understanding the Russian point of view. The Russians are fully aware of dynamics which are taking place here. And one thing which it cannot be really emphasized strong enough is basically Russia's uh, not involvement in the situation in Ukraine. They really wanted simply, just from my observations, talking to a lot of different people, including the pro-Moscow camp and party of regions, Simply, uh, there were a lot of different uh, appeals to Russia to even give a um, military advisor as well as pol- police help in order to quell the, the Maidan movement. And actually, Russia refused. The fundamental change took place beyond the economic uh, assistance, of course, which, which Putin extended. This diametrically changed on the 21st of night of the coup, which basically Russia felt it was basically a legal coup, and it goes against its all primary well-being in, in, and and their own self-interest. That's the reason I think the this whole pr- the, the coup itself has started the process of not only a uh, basic partition of Ukraine, which they've helped that's taking place, but also uh, put them into overdrive into protecting their own sphere of economic and political interests, namely their own basis within Sebastopol region, as well as the uh, pipeline, because one 
cannot be large emphasized large enough that the that the pipeline that goes through from Ukraine from Russia for Ukraine to Europe actually goes through the Crimea region itself. So uh, looking at the economic situations as well as the political geopolitical situation that was changing basically hour to hour, Russia justifiably so I believe. Uh, have taken a, a move to basically as a, as a defensive move to protect their own, not necessarily their own economic and geopolitical interests alone, but also its own population to what what is being seen as a chaos, you know, increasing fascism and variety of different completely chaos and razzmatazz in Kiev, which can then spread to other parts of the country. Now, uh, uh, what I off the top, what I said, do, do you agree with that? That we. It seems like where we're headed now, the uh, de facto recognition of Crimea, although the rhetoric will keep flying, um, th there seems to be no real strategic interest given the, co the potential repercussions for Russia to move into eastern Ukraine. And they, Putin says they have no plans to do so, although that could get out of, out of control if a local referendum is organized, mm -hmm. then what? Um, and, and a speeded up attempt by, uh, not attempt, they're going to do it, uh, of integrating uh, Ukraine into EU, and, and then the big deal will be, will that actually lead to NATO or not? Because that's not the same thing. Integrating EU doesn't necessarily no. mean NATO. That's true. Well, I think there are a lot of different things in the air right now, specifically from geopolitical active. Uh, they're looking at a situation simply as a uh, creation of a, basically a buffer state, which would basically, because one thing you have to also understand the importance of the Western border within a Russian psyche. They've been invaded, you know, Napoleon, uh, World War One, World War Two, uh, and actually the Western border itself has extremely very, uh, I think, important role in the national psyche. How they look at the national and international relations, and also their own political uh, setup as far as, as as far as the danger is concerned. So they're looking for specifically to preserve Ukraine more like a pro like a buffer state, just for its own preservation of its own geopolitical economic interests. When NATO would encroach on that, it's simply, it's got to the point where they really do not, first of all, feel betrayed because there are many different uh, allegations and proofs actually being presented uh, by a variety of different scholars, and you can dig into it later. Then during the uh, final uh, conversations and agreements when the when Soviet Union at the time allowed the uh, Germany to be reunited, there was an explicit promise made to Gorbachev at the time which was a general secretary of the Soviet party, that NATO would stop at the German borders and not, NATO would not simply extend towards eastward. And that that promise has been basically broken right. so many times. When when Russians basically feel they've been lied to and cheated to for so many times, that somebody, they basically had to draw their own line for both international as well as domestic purpose. Right. Well, we're, we're, we're going to dig into that whole history more later. But w would you agree with the characterization that in the final analysis, these are Russian oligarchs fighting with Ukrainian oligarchs, fighting with European oligarchs, fighting with American oligarchs? This is, this is all about who's going to feast on the peoples of all these countries. Uh, and and well, I guess what we don't see out of Ukraine right now is, is any kind of independent politics that represents the, really represents ordinary people of the Ukraine. That is true. And I, I think uh, when you're going to Ukraine, when I was at Maidan, it was not, this point was not reinforced strong enough that actually when, when you look at the overall, uh, the structure of the conflict itself, there are not only sides let's say, between government and, and the rest of the people. Actually, there are three sides. There's a, there was a government, there was the opposition, and there were the people. So uh, the situation got to the point where, uh, although uh, the official opposition have won and they basically got the major post within the government to, to basically divide the spoils, and repercussions of that are still being felt to this day, for example, with... Uh, Mr. Muzichko, which was actually, which was a right-wing leader, who just killed three days ago, and what many presume to be a hit uh, by some factions of the uh, of the of the Ukrainian government. Uh, what happens is people, the Maidan still exists. People are not going anywhere. So it's gotten a situation where Western media simply shifted the focus from what's going on in Ukraine to the Crimea and other issues, while Euromaidan still exists. There's tens of thousands of people there. They're basically stating stating that this is not our government. That we've been hijacked. Our power has been hijacked. We've been it's, it's, it sounds a lot like Egypt. Uh, yes. Thanks very much for joining us, and we'll, we'll do this again soon. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.